Testing, one, two, three, testing. Welcome to another episode of Creating Web3. I am your host, Tiffany Monahan, and I am joined here today by Simon Hardgart, and he's the head of business development at Parsec and IQ Labs. Welcome, Simon. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Tiffany. Super excited uh, to be here and talk more about Web3 and, and dive into it. So I would love to start, just have you jump right in, tell the listeners about yourself, about Parsec, IQ Labs and really just get into some of the topics that we're going to discuss today. We love to talk to you about NFTs, have a bit of overview about how IQ Labs came into fruition and where you guys started versus where you are now. And also hear about Parsec, which you mentioned is a real-time blockchain historical data platform. So what do all of these things mean? And I'm going to hand it over to you. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Sounds great. So uh, just background about the company, uh, Parsec and IQ Labs. We're about uh, 60, 60 plus people now. Uh, Parsec started in 2018, really from the need of developers in the blockchain space needed access to high quality blockchain data. So what Parsec is, is a platform where they can easily query both historical data but also subscribe to real-time data feeds to build their applications, whether that is to monitor events in the smart contract, whether that is to build dashboards on their front end connected to um, blockchain data, um, movement of NFTs, movement of tokens, stuff happening in their smart contracts, um, and really any data that they need. Um, right now, we started off in the, the real-time data space, and right now we just also launched one API for both real-time and historical blockchain data across uh, multiple data streams. Uh, we're also, the, the co-founding team is also behind IQ Labs, and IQ Labs is an NFT renting protocol. Uh, we finished our $12 million seed round a few months ago, led by Crypto.com, uh, Republic Capital and Sandeep from Polygon is one of our an angel investors, uh, the co-founder of Polygon. And how IQ Labs actually started was very interesting because um, Parsec has its own token. And before the demand for Parsec services wasn't tied to our token. So really our token holders weren't getting as much value. So we started IQ Labs in order to create essentially a decentralized SaaS software as a service subscription model underlying with the token being the form of payment. And how that worked at a very high level, let's imagine Netflix had a token. Um, in order to get access for, to Netflix, users could either hold a certain amount of Netflix tokens, let's say 10,000 tokens, um, and each token is $1 right now, that's $10,000. And what they would get is an NFT. And with that NFT, they would be able to watch Netflix for as long as they held that NFT, basically a lifetime subscription. Um, but the issue there, we, this was like very common in the blockchain space. And the issue there is that one, the user is exposed to the price fluctuation of that native token. So it's sort of like saying, in order to go watch Netflix, you have to purchase the company's stock, you're exposed to the price fluctuations. What we noticed is that people who just wanted to access the service didn't want that. So that's still an option with uh, the token version of IQ, IQ protocol, but also we created this uh, very interesting model where users could pay a monthly fee like they're used to, um, to Netflix. And what actually happens then is that they're borrowing a certain amount of tokens from uh, the people in the staking contract uh, we can dive into that a little bit more, but they're borrowing wrapped versions of the tokens and then they can get, and they expire after a month and then they can access the platform. And the fees that they pay to rent those tokens from the token stakers go back to the stakers in the form of interest. So these token stakers can earn non-inflationary rewards um, on their stake tokens. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about background, how the sort of two companies overlap a little bit. And our main focus at IQ Labs actually now is, and IQ Protocol is NFT renting. Uh, and we're working with a lot of blockchain games to implement NFT renting inside their games. 
um, as well as applications. Um, so we can talk about all the use cases there as well. Yeah, I would love to dive in to a lot of the things that you talked about. In particular, it would be great to get some more insights from you on IQ Labs and really, you know, understanding a little bit more on what does it actually mean to have the consumers or the users of these NFT be exposed to price fluctuation and how is this renting model actually helping them to stabilize that a little bit? Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons, again, we built IQ Labs and uh, IQ Protocol was to add utility to these NFTs. Um, well, first of all, like what an NFT is, and I know in past, uh, past uh, podcasts we went over that, but a lot of people view NFTs as like the media has put them uh, one way of, oh, there's this, these, JPEGs that are going for a crazy amount of money and there's no utility in them. So essentially IQ Protocol is a renting platform, but also a utility platform as well. And I personally view uh, NFTs as just a new file format. You can think about them. Um, a file format like PDF was and still is today. You can really store any information you want in them. And I think where we're really going is that legal contracts will be um, NFTs, maybe your house or car will be represented as an NFT um, in the future. Um, but for right now, they're more uh, gaming assets is really big. We're working with a lot of gaming companies um, and a lot of web two traditional game uh, company publishers. A lot of their talent is actually moving over to web three, we, we see um, just because NFT provides true ownership of these gaming assets. So I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of use cases. Um, let's say there is an event. Um, let's say it's in New York City. And we've probably all heard about CryptoPunks before and, and how much they went for and, and they're going for in eight terms now. Um, and these CryptoPunks, let's say they got you access to an event or uh, an exclusive party. And... Um, some people holders may be in Australia, some people might be in Southeast Asia, and they hold these NFTs, but they can't go to this event. They can't make it to New York or they don't want to make it to New York at that time. What IQ Labs would actually allow uh, these individuals to do would be rent these assets out to someone else that is in New York going to that event. So they can experience the utility of holding that NFT for that one night or for a week, maybe it's a retreat. Um, and that's really what we're building, that infrastructure to be able to add utility and be able to bring people into that community more so. Um, because right now with, with NFTs, it's the only option is like really buy and sell. If you wanted to pass ownership and sell it to someone else to experience that, that um, that utility that the NFT brings, you have to sell it. But now you can actually earn passive income on your NFTs and actually um, remain the owner of it as well. So a couple of interesting things here come to mind. So in the in a previous episode talking about the NFTs and you know you have all these utilities or these kind of perks if that if I can use that word that are attached to the NFT that you have so like you said it's an event or maybe it's a uh, free swag or an experience or early access to something that you have and it's essentially you're lending these like special moments to someone else to be able to to access which I think is super interesting and what I'm curious about is the aspect of NFTs where you're able to constantly, you know, if you sell that NFT, as you said before, it's to hold and then to sell, you know, you sell it, someone else sells it. The original creator is always having a, a piece of that sale. So they're always making a piece of the commission. So how then is IQ Labs thinking about the infrastructure for that continuation of the original creator? Yeah, no, that, that, that's, a, that's a great question um, for sure. And all of that can be like uh, programmed into the smart contract um, um, essentially as well. So uh, the original creator, um, we, would, we would need to, I guess they would need to adopt the standard. Um, 
I guess like IQ Labs works sort of like Stripe does today, um, just sort of our, I'm explaining our business model more so. So IQ Labs sort of, if you know Stripe, they take a percentage of, of the sales. We'll take a small cut of each rental fee. Um, projects who adopt the standard, let's say we take 3%. An asset is rented out for ten dollars. We'll take thirty cents, and we're are most likely going to either buy back and burn a token with that, or distribute it to our to our stakers. Final tokenomics are, are still being um, worked out. Um, then the people who are using our tech can define it in the smart contract what percentage of the revenue they want to take of that nine seventy left over, and the rest would would go to the renters. So the original asset creator or the original creator may not get an exact cut of it, but it may bring, um, it may bring more people to, to the community and it may bring more value um, through these NFTs because they have more utility through rentals, which in turn could potentially increase the value and increase um, buying and selling, which uh, the creator would, would then get a cut more so. Awesome. And for, for the creators, it's making me think too about, you know, like how do you really see the NFT space evolving? So it could be, as you said, an NFT could be like a, a legal contract or the car or the key to your car, the key to your house, but it could also be a game. It could be a, a work of art. So how do you really see as like more and more people are becoming interested in the space and infrastructure providers like you are coming up, how do you see that NFT space evolving? Yeah, I think like there's, there's tons of use cases. I've, I've talked to uh, teams before that are um, doing stuff in regards to real estate and that NFT is sort of um, represents that house. And if you think of like an Airbnb model, renting that NFT for a weekend or for a couple of days, you pay a certain fee. Um, and, then, um, and then maybe you connect that to a smart lock and an application that unlocks the door if you have that rented NFT for, for the weekend. So you could, you could create like an Airbnb model on top of it. Um, also I've talked to teams that are looking to build like uh, co-working spaces and maybe you have a monthly pass that you are, uh, that, that you own and it's an NFT and, uh, maybe you're traveling for the next week or on vacation for the next week. You could then rent it out to, to another individual to access that space while you're gone. Um, or maybe there's a coffee barista bar at this co-working space. Well, the co-working space could actually um, mint their own NFTs, they could then get access to, um, they could then rent them out to individuals sort of on like a monthly subscription basis, sort of like subscriptions today. Um, but the benefit there is, again, you can go back in history and view who your NFT holders were, and then you can apply additional perks maybe down the road as well. Um, so I, I view NFTs also as like a big, big marketing uh, opportunity. And with Parsec, something that we're just launching right now is uh, IQ, uh, is an NFT um, data lake essentially. So very granular protocols call specific data on NFTs. And you'll be able to query the data of what uh, is in a user's wallet. And in the future, you'll be able to query what has been in there historically uh, as well. So let's say, let's take two, two big companies. Um, let's say took Coke and Pepsi. Let's say Coke launched as their NFTs. Um, you could actually query that information that, hey, these are all the Coke NFT holders. And then as a brand, PepsiCo, for example, and Pepsi, you may want to actually find out all those, the holders of those Coke NFTs or who has held these Coke NFTs historically and then do like a, a interesting marketing drop. So just send those wallets um, uh, NF Pepsi NFTs, um, which could be an advert, it could be a, a JPEG, and you could add some utility beyond it. So if there's a lot of interesting marketing use cases you could do as well by looking at on-chain um, data um, about NFT holders, about token holders, about what a certain wallet has, uh, has been doing and, um, maybe predict what they're doing in the future as well. 
So this is super interesting because when you think about looking at the data, the data of the users based on their wallet, typically all you have is a wallet address and not necessarily the like traditional marketing data like, oh, she's a female age uh, between 25 and 30, this type of typical data. So are you seeing new types of data or are you seeing the old segmentation models trying to be translated into this space? I think it's like, it's a lot of the, the similar things based on like segmentation models um, that, that people are, are trying to build. But it also, since you don't have that age, gender, it takes a lot of that um, maybe bias that some of these segmentation models or maybe marketers have indirectly put bias into their segmentation models. So I find that very interesting because it's just based off uh, what's actually happening on chain, what NFTs they hold. You don't know if CryptoPunk holders are old boys or girls or, or whatever, um, but you know that they hold a CryptoPunk and like that community, right? Same thing with that Pepsi and Coke example. If, if they launch their own NFTs, you don't know gender, you just know, hey, they like to be part of that community. They may also hold these other NFTs um, and those NFTs may also be from drink brands. So maybe you could say, hey, all of these, this individual just loves the beverage industry and they're, they're a big drink consumer, right? So it, it, a lot of the similar segmentation like things in the Web2 world that, that we see, but again, we're moving maybe some of that bias, I would say, uh, overall. I love that. I hope so. And so actually, I want to go back a little bit because what you were talking about earlier with the NFT renting model and the example you gave of Airbnb, for example, I'm sure you get this question all the time, but what is why would somebody use an NFT as a renting model versus just the traditional Airbnb app? Yeah, I think there's, there's some, I, I guess there's like um, maybe like a cost element, right? Maybe not as large a percentage would go to Airbnb. Um, but also on top of that, you see some interesting things popping up about like fractional ownership of NFTs. So for example, let's say, there's this penthouse in New York that's super expensive, right? And traditionally, in order to invest in it, yes, there's probably vehicles you can go through and everything, but that's harder. Um, so traditionally, to invest in it, you would have to have the whole capital, probably millions and millions of dollars, to invest into this penthouse, right, and, and purchase it. With NFTs, you can do some really interesting things about fractionalizing ownership amongst 10 people, 100 people, and now you could essentially purchase that penthouse, which is represented in NFT. Um, you as a collective group, if it went up in value, if it went up 25%, you could decide and vote as a group if you wanted to sell it. And then based off the, the sale um, and smart contracts, it could get distributed back to these users. But also let's say that penthouse, if someone wanted to rent it out, then the rental fees could again, go back based off the percentages of the fractionalization to those specific individuals um, as well. So lots of interesting use cases about fractionalization. And I think we'll see real world assets um, get represented uh, as NFTs or tokens uh, as well. Yeah, it's kind of funny because it's making me think you could have a whole community, a whole Discord community who comes together and they buy a parcel of land in the metaverse and they build a penthouse and they say, why don't we all just buy into a real penthouse <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, it's almost making me feel like you have that reverse of like digital to physical then oh totally I've, I've talked to teams before that are essentially putting up like retail stores in the metaverse that tie back to physical objects and i think like advertising in the metaverse will will be a thing um just just on metaverse i like you hear metaverse talked about so much and at this point, I think what the metaverse is, is just either gaming or another place to sort of hang out with people, right? Um, that's sort of my view about the, the metaverse right now. So if you think about hanging out with your friends, you may do that in the mall. People already have been doing that online over Xbox or PlayStation and talking inside the game. 
So maybe you go to this uh, inside the metaverse in this um, metaverse mall, and then you have all like the the cool brands that you you like, and you may go like see some things with maybe an Oculus in the future or something along those lines, like a VR headset, and then purchase it there. Um, and then it comes in into your digital space as well. But I think we will see this mixture of real world and digital come together. And, uh, and I think, I don't think we're ever going to leave the, the real world, right? I think a lot of people in the crypto community are like metaverse, metaverse, metaverse. But I think the two worlds are going to come together and have their use cases and, and times as well. Yeah, I hear a lot about this metaverse where it's like you have the physical, you have the digital, and then you have the virtual. And essentially the digital is like this emergence of the physical and the virtual. And yeah. uh, another element that I think is interesting as well is when people hear about metaverse, like a lot of brands, they right now are saying oh we have to go like FOMO we have to go into the metaverse like we have to do something in the metaverse like let's just do something and people are often thinking about it as like a, a sales channel um, or maybe just like a marketing tool to to leverage and when I mean you as as IQ and as Parsec are thinking about the metaverse like are you thinking about oh we should do some like we should go into there and buy a parcel of lab or buy a parcel of land or like how are you guys thinking that businesses should really be approaching this concept of the metaverse yeah you starting to see some some like traditional companies come into the nft space the metaverse space and i think it's really hard for them because they don't really fully understand the, the culture and the crypto community traditionally, like how it, how it operates. So I'm starting to talk to companies since we're more of an infrastructure project. I actually had a call with a company this morning that is doing that exact thing. How do we bring these traditional companies? How do we um, set them up with their metaverse strategy or Web3 strategy? Um, and how do we help them along their journey? So they understand the culture, they understand how to add utility to their NFTs. And when I'm talking to these types of companies, we're, again, we're in infrastructure, so we will work with everyone. Um, but we, we talk a lot about a lot of use cases about how do you add utility to these NFTs if you're a company coming in and you launch your NFT collection and uh, maybe it has this utility, maybe then you want to maybe you launched 10,000 NFT collection, right? Well, before with this 10,000 NFT collection, really you only are attracting 10,000 people, right? Maybe you attract a little bit more once those people sell and another person buys for that utility, but with adding renting to that um, tied to the utility, you can actually bring a lot more people together um, in addition to those 10,000 actual holders of it. So. That's sort of how we're thinking about it. Um, we we are going to have our own marketplace as well, um, which is, which is exciting. Um, but also at the end of the day, we're that core um, technology that any brand can use, any company, whether that's gaming or down to the individual creator, um, also. I would love to hear more about this marketplace. So I, I'm hearing a lot of Web three companies like Ledger just launched a marketplace. Like, what does the marketplace look like for you? Yeah, so with our technology, like working with a lot of games, as you mentioned, every company sounds like they're going to have their own marketplace. And we build our technology in a way where you can go, you can create your marketplace, and you can just add a rental button connected to, um, connected to our technology in the back end. And not to get too technical, but... When you use our technology, you actually are creating your own IQ enterprise or IQ verse, which is essentially your own smart contract that's trustless. It's, it's permissionless. Like we don't have control of that when you go do that. Um, yes, like I said earlier, the, the percentage of the rental fees baked into that smart contract to use our technology, but anyone can go do that and integrate our technology on their own marketplace. Um, we're going to have them, our marketplace as well, because a lot of the teams we're working with, 
either their team's smaller um, or they just don't have the time to build their own marketplace. So they can direct their community um, to our marketplace and use our marketplace um, or even for the individual creator who wants to launch their own NFT collection and add utility, they could post it on our marketplace as well. Um, just one more thing about that. There's some interesting use cases about like expanding the reach with our marketplace. Um, so in the future, we plan to do this dual listing thing. So if you have an asset, um, you track a bunch of users on your marketplace, when you list it for rent on your marketplace, let's say you're a game, could automatically also show up and be listed on our marketplace as well. And the advantage there for games working with us is that as we grow our audience um, and our marketplace and our technology, um, it would also just expand the reach to a different set of users and consumers and people that are maybe exploring our marketplace for a creator that they come to see that has some NFT in our marketplace they may then also be interested in gaming and rent out that gaming asset. So that's sort of how we're thinking about uh, our marketplace and, and also not really competing against all these marketplaces, but again, building that core tech to enable the rental use cases across different marketplaces uh, as well. I love that. And I don't know if it's uh, too much of a rabbit hole to get into, but I would be curious of your thoughts too on the usability of some of the things that are listed on the marketplace and how they would work from going from one digital game, for example, to another digital game, or would you be pretty much confined within the constraints of where that NFT was actually created? Yeah, so that's that's really interesting. Um, we are working with games um, that want to for example, we have three games that are actually working together right now, um, and they want to rent out their assets across the different games for different utilities. Um, we also are talking about games that want to do the same thing, but across different blockchains. And how we're sort of thinking about that is uh, the mechanics of how our technology actually works is we you never pass ownership of your NFT to another individual, actually, when you rent it out. Going back to that CryptoPunk example that we talked about earlier and going to that event in New York, if I was renting it out to you, Tiffany, how it would work is I would deposit that CryptoPunk into uh, a smart contract. I wish I had a CryptoPunk, I don't, but let's just imagine here. Uh, <laughs> I would deposit that CryptoPunk into that smart contract. I would say, Tiffany, you can rent it or whoever wants to rent it for $50. Someone would pay $50 to go to that event for that one evening. And what would appear in your wallet, Tiffany, is a wrapped expirable version, right? So you don't ever get ownership of the original. It stays in that smart contract. You get a wrapped version with the same look and feel, the same metadata. And then the, the team that is accepting that wrapped version or building the application to um, go to this event would just accept that wrapped version um, like it's the original for that rental period. So one night here could be a week for a different use case with our API and SDK. So you don't have to put up, I don't have to, you don't have to put collateral to rent. It's just a fixed fee rental. And uh, I'm never passing ownership to uh, another individual. You just get that wrapped version. Um, so that's sort of the mechanics around that uh, as well. Yeah, I think going with like the, the eBay example, like there's a lot of friction with, with selling things, I guess, online today, you have to, um, well, not, not this digital product, but like with the art example, 
uh, you would have to agree upon a price. You would have to set up a time to meet, um, to, to transfer ownership. They'd have to check if it's like actually um, the real one potentially. But with, with NFTs, you can just set your price that you want. And through smart contact technology, um, you'd be able to, once someone deposits that agreed upon money, automatically transfer that NFT to, to their wallet. So I think like, I don't know if that answers your question, but just more broadly, I think there's a lot of interesting use cases coming for companies that use smart contracts on whatever blockchain that, that they want to build upon. Um, another really interesting use case would be insurance and like flight protection for delayed insurance, for example, right? How that would work is you purchase your, your flight insurance, right? Um, and then you would have a smart contract that said, hey, if the flight's delayed more than two hours, you get your payout. Now, we're using something like an Oracle, like Chainlink, you'd be able to connect to a real world system that would be able to look at all the flight delays. And then if that flight delayed is more than two hours, it would communicate with that smart contract and automatically do the payout. So just from a customer experience perspective, I think there's like a lot of value because I've gone through that before and filling out uh, ticket after ticket and following up with these companies just to get a little bit of money um, or what we agreed upon in the first place uh, is, is a headache sometimes. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to streamline processes, improve customer experiences, just leveraging smart contracts uh, and, and that technology as well. Completely agree. And so, Simon, I know you're coming to Paris in the next couple of weeks, and so perhaps some of our listeners can get in touch with you to reach out, but I'm curious, the, the Metaverse Summit is coming, and I'm curious about, you know, what you're hoping to get out of it or what you're most interested in seeing. Yeah, I um, what I'm interested to get out of it, just to see every conference I go to, um, see so many interesting things. I see so much talent coming into to Web3. Um, you're just interested in building. I was um, at Consensus about a month ago in, in, in Austin and then a couple of weeks ago I was in NFT NYC. So um, just looking for developers out there who want to build NFT renting use cases or leverage blockchain data, uh, which is most uh, protocols or companies building on blockchain. Um, so if you need any of that, uh, please, please reach out. Um, and then also what I'm personally excited about as an industry, I think we've built some amazing tech, but I think one thing that has been lacking overall and what I'm starting to see more focus on is really the UI UX. Um, if we're going to bring on the next billion users, we, we're going to need really seamless user experiences, the, more of the traditional technology that we use every day. Someone doesn't like creating a wallet or sometimes like 
if you create your own wallet, you have like your seed phrase, you have to remember all your words, you have to store that properly. Um, and although maybe that would be more ideal, more secure, or maybe a hardware wallet would be more ideal or secure, I think as an industry, um, we hold on to those ideals a little bit. Whereas I think we need to accept maybe you can create a wallet with your Google log on. And there's some companies doing that. And then over time, maybe we educate these users on maybe what would be a little bit more secure. Um, and then also from the front end perspective, I think we need to build technology where you don't need to know and have a, a degree in, in crypto or blockchain technology to actually use some of these things and, and feel safe using some of these things. I think the, the best ideal state would be leveraging blockchain as more of the rails and build applications that some users would never even know that they're interacting with blockchain, but it just provides the advantages of faster settlement or peer-to-peer -peer, uh, interactions or what NFTs would bring. So I'm excited to see more teams like up their game with UI UX and, and just overall the, the space move that way uh, a little bit more. Awesome. Well, Simon, thank you so much for joining Creating Web3. And I will put in the link to, or in the show notes of this episode, the link to IQ, the link to Parsec, and folks can reach out to you, try to find you at the Metaverse Summit. But thank you so much for joining. No problem. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, yeah, looking to chat more in the future.